In this final set, we're going to talk about two practical issues in the context of training. The first one has to do with this um, mathematical uh, equation that I mentioned in the previous set uh, for the Krieging prediction, and namely that um, the C prime C inverse Y minus XB part in the equation. The problem is the C inverse. As I mentioned previously, that is a variance covariance matrix, and it's of the dimension of the data set. And it's the inverse of the variance covariance matrix, which is a, a complex mathematical operation be, which becomes impractical for very large data sets. So, um, why use this full variance covariance matrix? Well, there's actually not a good reason. Why not? Because we know, we already know, that when the distances become large enough, then for all practical purposes there is no covariance between the pairs of points. And so, rather than dragging all these points along in a large matrix that needs to be inverted, which is a very complex numerical procedure. Instead, we take a subset of the covariance matrix, and we limit the covariance matrix to the nearest points to the location that we want to predict. So, for example, we uh, take the nearest 50 points rather than all points in the data set, because we know that the points that are further away for all practical purposes, it will not have a big influence on the precision of the estimates. So uh, that is called local Krieging. Of course, it's somewhat arbitrary as to how local this should be. This is a matter of practice, and in the lab, you will experiment with different windows for local Krieging. Um, related to that is how do we know how good the model is. So how do we assess model performance? We have a measure of fit uh, from fitting the variogram model to the empirical variogram, but that doesn't really tell us anything about the predictive performance. Because due to the nature of the model, the fit to the observations themselves will be perfect. And the fit to the other locations we don't know because we don't have any observations for them. So the only way to have a sense of the out-of-sample performance, so to speak, is to fake it. And so uh, the way we fake it is we do what is called in machine learning, we use a training data set. In other words, we take a subset of the data to fit the model and then use the rest of the data that we didn't use to fit the model in the prediction. And then because we have actual observations for those locations, we can assess the fit. And this is called cross-validation. It's a very powerful technique. It is uh, very common in machine learning and in many of the modern data mining uh, approaches. So the principle is very simple. You take, you split the data, one part of the data you use to fit the model, and then the other part of the data you use to assess the quality of the model. And, and one um, reason for doing this is to avoid what is called overfitting. Overfitting is uh, uh, not a good property. It's where the model fits the observed data very well, but that doesn't mean that the model is good to predict unobserved data. So to uh, kind of correct for that, we have this training data set and then a test data set to see how well the model fits. And there are a number of ways in which this can be done. The simplest one is called leave one out cross-validation. Um, it is what it says it is. You go through the data set, you drop one observation, you fit the model using the remaining observations, and then you predict the data point that you dropped. And then, because you have the observed value, you can have a measure of fit. And then, 
at the end of this exercise, after you cycle through all the observations, you average the measure of fit over the observations. Okay. So leave one out cross-validation is very easy to do. We just drop one variable, fit the model, predict the remaining variable. K-fold cross-validation is a simple extension of this, which um, can be more robust and is another safeguard against overfitting is rather than leaving one observation out you leave any number of observations out uh, k in other words so maybe you leave 10 observations out so you drop 10 fit the model on the remaining ones and then predict the 10 and somehow average out the the measure fit for those 10 predicted values so in general you fit the model to n minus k data points you predict the k data points that were left out and assess a measure of fit. And in the lab, we'll try uh, doing this uh, for our sample data sets. And then at the end, you have this kind of a table where, for example, in the Baltimore data set, we compare the spherical to the exponential model. And we have, uh, on the basis of a leave one out cross validation exercise, we see that the average error is a little bit smaller for the exponential, but the mean squared error is a little smaller for the spherical model, and then back the correlation between observed and predicted is a, a little larger for the spherical model. So even though on average the error is a little larger for the spherical model, the two other criteria, which are actually more robust and more reliable criteria, the mean squared error and the correlation between observed and predicted gives a slight edge to the spherical model. But it's only slight. Basically, in this particular example, um, one would have to conclude that the two models are basically equivalent. So that concludes our discussion of spatial prediction.